Hi, my name is Dr Peter Kay and this is the next lecture um, in this series on, on the internal combustion engine. Um, my contact details are on the slide here, so if you have any comments or queries, then um, please come and see me. So th this is week number six, and this is a split, split lecture between... I'm um, going to talk about numerical methods and how they're applied to um, internal combustion engines and also basic hybrids, and that's the focus of this presentation. If you haven't seen any of the previous five, then please go and look at those first. Okay, so in this lecture, I'm first going to talk about um, legislative uh, drivers and um, what's pushing um, hybrid technology, and then introduce um, the different type of hybrids that are available and the technologies that are emerging, um, the different types and the pros and cons of each. Then talk how a hybrid vehicle operates, the types of technology that are applicable to hybrids, and finally I'll talk about future trends um, and how we're going to meet uh, future emission targets. Okay, so um, don't really need me to tell you that it's widely accepted that climate change is becoming a reality, and there's a greater drive for sustainability and CO2 reductions. Um, this is particularly um, prevalent in automotive because uh, autom in 2012 um, the automotive industry or you know, cars and transport sector contributed approximately 20% of CO2 emissions in the UK. So the automotive sector is a big part of the, um, the problem but also can be part of the solution as we see with um, new technologies. So, <clears throat> to encourage um, CO2 reduction, legislation has been developed to limit um, automotive emissions and promote sustainability. So this comes in the form of the Kyoto Protocol that um, you probably know about, that um, we've agreed to. But also, um, in terms of renewable energy targets, um, so the 2020 20% 20 uh, renewable energy by 2020, of which 10% 10 is, 10 is for transportation, and also the so-called Euro standards, which is it limits the emissions of um, ga uh, exhaust products hazardous to health from all vehicles sold within the European Union. So, <clears throat> as I just said, the um, the automotive industry is committed to CO two reduction and low emitting vehicles. But um, as of anything, um, future technologies um, won't be cheap. Um, you know, uh, every time you try to introduce something, there's a cost associated with that, and um, it's going to be hard to to um, to engage the public to buy it because um, environment my environmental impact isn't necessarily uh, the dominant factor in um, when a customer's purchasing a vehicle. You know, they're looking at power or um, maybe efficiency or comfort or safety or whatever. But <clears throat> this is kind of the same problem that the, the diesels had when they first came into, came onto the market. Um, it started off that, first of all, people were buying them for costs and um, accepting a kind of... Um, that they weren't as, as, as powerful or responsive as gasoline vehicles, but because the, the diesel was cheaper, they were, they were making that sacrifice. But more and more now, um, customers are buying um, diesels on merit, um, rather than just because they're, they're cheaper to run. And I think this trend will continue with um, hybrid vehicles as well. Um, so as I just said, fuel cost does influence customer decisions, um, and maybe that that's a good way of encouraging uh, hybrid vehicles um, in the future. Okay, so what is a hybrid? Well, technically a hybrid vehicle is a vehicle that uses two or more distinct power sources to power the vehicle. So I've got a couple of um, examples here to illustrate that. This is a submarine. So um, whilst on the surface as it is now, it has a diesel generator which is propelling the, um, which is turning the prop, which is pushing it through the water, but it's also charging the submarine batteries. So when it submerges, it can turn off the um, the diesel engine and run on batteries to propel it through the water. <coughs> it 
in this instance, the submarine isn't doing this for any environmental gain, just purely um, uh, for clande clandestine um, reasons, to, 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 so it can't be found. Um, trains tend to, these electric trains um, tend to have a, a diesel engine, well, diesel generator, I should say, um, that generates electricity, which then um, powers an electric motor and um, powers the train up and down the tracks. And then, of course, we've got um, vehicles such as Lewis Hamilton's um, Mercedes here, which, um, as you may know, the current um, F1 allows uh, always enforced hybrid engines. So we've got energy recovery systems, regenerative braking, um, which um, not, which recovers the energy f from the vehicles it's braking, which then also can be fed back into the wheels as accelerating out the corners. <coughs> okay, so in terms of types of hybrid, um, there's several subtypes. So the basic um, one is a hybrid, hybrid electric vehicle. So this combines a conventional internal combustion en engine um, with an electric propulsion system. Um, another kind of extension of that is what's called the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So it's the same as that, but um, instead of just the batteries being um, charged from the uh, internal combustion engine, um, it can actually be plugged in into the grid and the batteries can be um, charged um, from an external source. There are range extender electric vehicles, so this is kind of the, like the diesel train. Um, and then auxiliary power unit is built into an all-electric vehicle to increase its all-electric range. So the engine isn't really an engine in it, this instance. It's more running as a generator at a, a set RPM, um, charging the batteries to increase, increase the range of the vehicles. And for all of these, um, there are um, two types. There are subtypes, um, either parallel or series. And we'll talk about the, those on the next couple of slides. So a series hybrid vehicle. So for this series hybrid vehicle, so you can see a very um, crude um, schematic of the vehicle here. So as in, um, you know, electrical, electrical circuit, if you have resistors in series or parallel, it's kind of the same thing. So. The engine, all the power um, uh, train is in series, so the engine isn't directly connected to the to the driving wheels. So what it does is it takes energy from its fuel source, fuel tank, uh, that runs the engine, which then um, runs the transmission, so it's basically say, acting as a generator. That then is fed to the motor, which is controlled by the electronic control unit. So whether that um, electricity is fed directly to the motor or used to recharge the batteries so that it can run um, on all electric, um, that, that's decided by the electronics. And then so we've got battery storage um, motor, which then um, runs transmission, which is, goes via, via the transmission to the wheels. So in here, red is kind of, um, is meant to be sort of mechanical um, power whereas blue is kind of electrical power. Um, the, we'll do, talk about this a bit later on, but the ECU um, and how hybrid vehicles manage the power and energy on board is quite, quite can, or can be quite complicated and does vary a lot from manufacturer to manufacturer, depending on how much um, they want to regenerate. So if you come off the throttle, does it start regenerating straight away or does it um, prefer to coast for a bit before you actually um, press the brake when it starts to recover the energy. So a lot of um, design um, research has been put into this and there's no there's no standard way of um, controlling, uh, controlling each, the engine and the, the electronics. So in parallel mode, so and as this suggests, um, both the engine and the motor are connected to the transmission, which are then connected to the driving wheels. So both of them can power it. So um, 
And again, it's up to the ECU and the electronics on board as to whether the engine is running and powering the vehicle or the motor is running and powering the vehicle. So um, if the engine's running, that um, power or energy can also be used to turn the motor to generate electricity to charge the batteries. Now there is um, a sub um, system of a uh, group of hybrid vehicles called um, kind of mild hybrids and so you can either have a mild parallel hybrid or full parallel hybrid and the difference is a mild hybrid would only use a very compact electric motor so um, wouldn't be used so the motor would be quite small and it wouldn't be used um, generally for um, powering the vehicle for substantial periods of time or at high speeds it would be more used just for um, getting the vehicle off the line power assist for um, you know overtaking or for sharp acceleration and also for uh, regenerative brake braking and charging the batteries <clears throat> so the main difference um, advantages and disadvantages of the two um, kind of summarized in this table so for a seri series um, hybrid um, this is the advantage that the transmission is simpler so you're not just you're not trying to design a transmission system that um, can cope with um, both the internal combustion engine and the motor and this this is um, perhaps more subtle than it um, seems at first because um, motors have high torque at low speed and internal combustion engines have, tend to have high torque at high speed so for the parallel <clears throat> you need to design a gearbox that's going to withstand those torques over the, the whole speed range whereas if you just design it for the motor you can just design it for the power curve of the motor um the series uh in terms of the transmission the series uh hybrid also gives you the option of putting one motor per wheel rather than just in the diagrams i showed um the motor just powering one axle so this gives you the advantage for an all-wheel all drive hybrid, whereas you can't really do that with the. It'd be more. Well, sorry, it'd be much more complex to do that with a parallel hybrid. Um, you know, as as mechanical and the electric drive is is required. Um, however, um, what kind of leads on from that is the parallel hybrid has the advantage that speeds and torques can be chosen independently. So. I just mentioned you can use the electric motor for low speeds high torque to get off the line and then when you're at high speeds you can use the motor um, con convert to the internal combustion engine to give you the torque at the higher end <clears throat> Whereas a, and um, with a series hybrid at the high speeds um, it's not as efficient as the parallel and the reason for that is because because the internal combustion engine isn't directly connected to the transmission, your um, your efficiency is lower because you've got two efficiency losses. So you've got the efficiency loss of converting the fuel into um, power through the um, internal combustion engine, but then you're also losing energy as you're um, converting that um, power back into electricity, or sorry, not back into electricity, but into electricity um, through the motor. Uh, um, which then get, gets to the wheels. Um, so you've got two two lots of efficiency losses. So at higher speeds, it's not as good. Um, in terms of size, um, for a parallel hybrid, a smaller electric motor is required because you don't need, um, as we say, the, the the motor at higher speeds. Um, and for the series, although you can get away with a smaller internal combustion engine because or it's not um, all it's doing is that running as a generator uh, you do need an electric a larger electric motor because that's your your main drive so kind of overall the series hybrid is better predominantly for urban driving whereas parallel um, which tend to be more popular at the minute better for general purpose driving okay so this schematic here shows um, basically very basic uh, um, operation of a hybrid and this won't be exact to an, and it's not um, common for each type of vehicle as I said at the start of the presentation um, each manufacturer will um, 
code their software accordingly depending on how they they think that their customers are going to drive their vehicles so this varies um, massively from vehicle to vehicle but generally this is um, how the, um, a hybrid vehicle works so we kind of got um, six different um, stages of driving across the top here so we've got launch or you know accelerating away from the line you've got gentle acceleration so once you've got that initial um, off the line getting up to speed um, cruising along the flat full acceleration or pulling a high load going up a steep slope um, deceleration where you're um, breaking down a hill or coming to a stop and finally when you've brought the the vehicle to rest and in this table, um, I've highlighted for the electric motor and also for the internal combustion engine what um, mode they're in. And what this um, graph at the bottom is attempting to show here is the amount of energy that's either being consumed, so um, positive above the, the axis, or um, uh, re recharged or absorbed um, below the line where it's negative. So um, getting off the line, um, normally, as I said, the um, electric motor has high torque at low speeds. So the internal combustion engine would be off at this point. So you're saving fuel. You don't need it for this. And the electric motor would be on and that would come on and get you off the line. And once you got away, the internal engine would kick in. So for gentle acceleration, <coughs> excuse me, that... Um, um, the internal combustion engine will be better, so the electric engine will be off. When you're cruising, um, the electric um, motor will be running backwards, so it'll be running as a, as a generator. And the some of the, the power that's um, being delivered by the internal combustion engine um, will be consumed, if you like, by the electric engine to charge the, the electric motor to charge the batteries for when you next need some electric power um, then whilst you're up to speed if you suddenly need um, some acceleration or come to a steep slope the um, electric motor can kick in to give you that power boost then as you come off the um, accelerator and start braking um, you get some regenerative braking um, I'm not going to go into regenerative um, braking in detail in this lecture at all I'm going to leave that because that will be covered later in the module um, when you start talking about transmission. In a way, at this stage, the, the internal combustion engine is switched off to save fuel. And finally, when the vehicle comes to rest, or just, um, in fact, some vehicles switch off when they're, they're going very slowly, kind of two, two or three miles per hour, um, both the electric motor and internal combustion engine are switched off um, to save fuel. Okay, <clears throat> this plot um, kind of shows the, the different technologies that are available for um, delivering power um, to, to get the vehicle off the line and um, uh, to use for power assist. I've shown this because, um, although I'm not going to go to these technologies in detail, I wanted to kind of show um, that the kind of the relationship between energy density and power density and the way to think of this is if you think of a um, a bottle of water um, now the bottle of water is kind of the the energy density so that's how much energy you can store so if you have a bigger bottle of water you have more energy um, the more you can fit more water inside of it so if you have a bigger battery you can stick more water in that or if you have a bigger fuel tank you've got um, more energy <coughs> so the, that's kind of um, non-dimensionalized by well, not non-dimensionalized but um, against the the, um, the density so you've kind of got joules per kilogram here and then on this axis we've got power density which is watts per kilogram so what this is, is this is how quickly you can deliver that energy so if I think of my um, bottle of water if I take the lid off it, this is how quickly I can pour the water out of the bottle so if I've got a bigger um, 
nozzle or opening on the bottle I can get the get the water out quicker so I can get, deliver more power. So you can see here that some of the technologies such as um, fuel cells and batteries um, well particularly fuel cells they have a lot of energy but you can't deliver it very quickly so just to give you an idea the um, internal combustion engines are up in this sort of um, portion of the, the graph up here so internal combustion engines I've got an F1 engine and just um, for interest but you've got a lot of energy um, and I mentioned this in one of the previous lectures that um, fossil fuels it, the energy density is actually very high so it's really good and you can also um, get it out quickly you know you can burn it very quickly despite what we were saying in the um, gas exchange lecture so they're right in the good part of this plot so whereas fuel cells um, say they've got a lot of energy but you can't deliver it very quickly so um, might not be suitable for you know, um, some applications you know if you need to get to get that quickly likewise um, supercapacitors um, they will give you the power over sorry they will give you the energy over a very short time which means that they have a high power density but they can't store much energy and batteries are kind of um, down the bottom here that they that they don't have much power and you can't really get it back so this is kind of the issue when you come to think about hybrids and what your secondary um, system is going to be whether it's a flywheel or fuel cell or battery or capacitors is you really need to think about how much energy you can store on your vehicle and how quickly you need to get it back and this, this is a big consideration um, going forward okay so going forward I just want to kind of bring it back now to um, the emissions so um, hybrid technologies are gonna help improve um, fuel efficiency and we need it because we're gonna there's a couple of um, EU targets that have come in for um, mandatory t emissions targets that have come in for cars we've, we've got the euro standards which cover the emissions but um, they don't explicitly state um, uh, levels of CO2 that um, um, need to be met. So from 2015 um, the average fleet CO2 emissions must be less than 130 grams um, per kilometre. Now what the what that means in reality is what the let me just explain what fleet CO2 emissions. So this is a um, a target that's been placed on a manufacturer so on average, um, Ford or Mitsubishi or you know whoever, their range of cars must on average be less than 130 grams per kilometer. So they can have quite heavy, quite thirsty um, cars which um, generate more CO2 than let's say the 130 gram target. But what it means is they must have vehicles in their range which are set, selling in similar volumes that are much less than that to balance out. So it's an average across the fleet of the um, the whole the current manufacturer's um, <clears throat> range. And this will be decreasing to 95 grams per kilometre in 21. Sorry, 2021. And heavy fines are in place if the limits are exceeded. So from 20... This is already in effect, actually, but... Um, it's kind of a little bit less than this, but from 2019, um, the fine is 95 euros per gram per kilometre exceeded per vehicle registered. So if you've got, um, say, a vehicle that's 131 grams per um, kilometre and you've sold a million of them, then it means that you're, you're one gram over the limit, so that's 95 euros um per gram exceeded times a million because you've got a million of those vehicles registered so it'd be 95 million euros so you can see that this um, and ramp up this plot here shows the um, the co2 um, the historical average 
complete CO2 emissions um, and plotted the the targets on that, so 130 going down to 95. So you can see that the trend is kind of on the right way. We're, we're um, on track to meet the, the 2015 target. So I've got the um, historical data for um, 2014 or 15. So we're on track to meet the target, but um, and it looks like is that if you extended that plot down, we are going to meet the 95 target. But as you know, um, in engineering, as you get tend to get more and more efficient, we're going to start getting to um, laws of distant um, diminishing returns. I put this um, plot up because this is. Um, some information that I got from a presentation that uh, Ricardo presented in Cardiff a few years back. Some of the data is a little bit out of date, but I still think it's um, a good illustration of where they think that things are going to go in the future. If you don't know who Ricardo um, are, look them up. They're um, an engine consultancy based um, in Shoreham upon the sea down on the south coast near to Brighton and that they are very good at what they do and they they publish papers for governments and well for our government in a way um, <clears throat> and they put this together so what they're saying is these um, are basically different parameters or different technologies that need to penetrate into the market for us to meet the 95 um, grams per kilometer CO2 target in 2020. So, what I'm saying is here, vehicle weight. So, if we can reduce the vehicle weight, weight um, then we're going to save CO2 because um, it's less mass to accelerate, brake, etc. So, if we keep it the same, so this is a change in the market, um, as in um, percentage sold, then this is the effect that it will have on the CO2 emissions. So, if we don't change the weight, we have no change on CO2 emissions. Makes sense. <clears throat> if um, we have a 3% three, 3 reduction in vehicle weight, and that's a 100% change in the market, that will give us a 2% reduction in CO2. If we have a 10% reduction in vehicle mass, um, that will give us a and by 2020 that will give us a 5% reduction in CO2. So you can kind of see how this is going. Um, diesels, if we can um, bring up, um, get to 65% diesel penetration um, by 2020, that will give us another 7%. Gasoline direct injection, if we can increase the um, that market up to um, 40%, we've got another saving the CO2. Um, variable valve action, that gives us another 5%. Engine downsizing, so um, turbocharging. Uh, again, similar powers out for smaller engines. So downsizing by 15 up to, So if we can downsize by 20%, um, in a, and a 30% market share, it gives 7%. Anyway, you, you can read through this. But basically, you can see that we get down to here. And we don't actually need um, any kind of much um, hybrid technology till we get down here. So it's only a lot of we can make a lot of gains um, in terms of emissions without hybrid technology. But you do need the stop-start technology, the regenerative braking, the mild hybrids and downsizing, and the parallel, parallel um, hybrids to get down to give you the extra few percent to get down to the 95 um, grams per kilometer thing so I thought that was an interesting conclusion that they made there that you can actually get a lot of the way to the, towards those emission targets just with um, you, you know good effectively good design and um, m making the internal combustion engine more efficient but then you do need to look at the hybrid technologies to to get you to um, get you towards the final target. <clears throat> Finally, um, this is also a study by Ricardo, and I've put it up because, to be perfectly honest, I 
kind of was still um, skeptical about this um, until I read it. The one of the biggest um, comments or complaints about hybrids is that actually overall um, the the life cycle analysis, so cradle to grave, the, um, the CO two produced um, by a hybrid vehicle is more than a conventional gasoline car, and the studies aren't saying that. Um, this is just one study by Ricardo and also um, tallies with several other studies that have been done. And what this is showing is this is showing the um, equivalent grams of CO2 per kilometre for vehicles over its lifetime. And they've compared a petrol internal combustion engine car, a petrol um, hybrid, um, petrol plug-in hybrid, petrol range extender and this one is just a um, uh, full electric battery electric vehicle and you can see that based on 2010 data um, the electrics are actually better over the life, uh, life um, style over the whole life cycle and even going forward to 2050 so trying to make some assumptions about um, what's happening in the future you can see that the um the still the the full electrics and hybrids are actually um better uh, over the whole life cycle okay so to conclude then I talked about the legis legislative um drivers and why hybrids are important so we can do a lot of it with good engine design and making our internal combustion engines more efficient but we do need hybrids to get to that last few percent to meet future um, emissions targets um, talked about hybrids so we introduced what a hybrid is the different types the difference between parallel and series um, and the advantages of um, those two types talked about hybrid operation and although there isn't a common method um, showed a typical driving cycle and how the um, internal combustion engine and uh, electric motor work, work, work together talked about different types of technology the um, power density for, um, and uh, energy density so you might be able to have you might have the energy there but if you can't access it effectively access it in the time that you want then um, it's no good to you and talked about future trends of CO2 emissions okay so that concludes this lecture on basic hybrids um, again my details are here if you have any comments then um, let me know thank you for listening